Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, yeah, the I'm board... sorry, you have 20 minutes. Please yeah. try and keep the yeah. time while yeah. Glyn and, and uh, Richard will have 10 minutes each. Yeah. Thank you. Very pleased to be here. Um, the Bund, which means union in Yiddish, was a vibrant secular so Jewish socialist working class movement formed in 1897 at a clandestine meeting in a safe house in Vilna in the Tsarist Russian Empire. One of the better known Bundists, Marek Edelman, second in command in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, who died in Poland in 2009, um, said, Bundists did not wait for the Messiah, nor did they plan to leave for Palestine. They believed Poland was their country and they fought for a just socialist Poland um, in which each nationality would have its own cultural autonomy and in which minorities' rights would be guaranteed. That gives a hint of the movement's philosophy and dynamism. I want to pose and answer some questions and share some images to give you a flavor of what Bundism represents. So I'm going to share the screen um, now. And um, just want to um, check that you can, oh, um, oh, a minute, I'll just bring it across. Okay. Um, so can you give me a thumbs up if you can see that? All right. Great. OK, um, so you can see a set of questions there. They're the questions I, I want to answer over the next in, in that 20 minutes. Um, there's a couple of images. The main image um, an is on the left is an election poster from 1918, and it states a key Bundist message. Dorten wo mir leben, dort ist unser Land. The place where we live, that is our country. On the right, you can see local activists in Warsaw 101 years later, um, um, and they are holding a Bund flag before joining hundreds of people marching to commemorate the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. I was there, and the Bund's symbolic presence that day was astonishing. The Bund was formed in 1897 within the Pale of Settlement, the area in which nearly all the Russian Empire's Jews were forced to live. It included Lithuania, Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, and parts of Latvia. Also in 1897, the Zionist movement was founded in a plush venue in Basel. Zionists also sought support from the empire's Jewish masses, but were more successful among small capitalists. And I'm going to go to the next slide. The Bund focused on the working class. By the 1890s, three things were happening simultaneously. Embryonic trade unions organized workplace struggles and supported strikers' families through mutual aid. Bundist ideologues led clandestine Marxist education circles in workers' homes. The first um, Yiddish socialist newspapers were published, Yiddish Arbeiter, Jewish Worker, and Arbeiter Stimme, The Worker's Voice. There's a popular Bund, Bund story that illustrates how class conflict often played out as socialist versus Zionist. An industrial dispute led to a factory lockout. The boss stood on the factory balcony and told the workers below that he could not meet their wage demands. He threatened to jump to his death if they did not withdraw them. And the crowd replied, jump, Zionist pig. Mir wollen schicken die Beine came Palestina. We'll send your bones to Palestine. The wider revolutionary party the RSDLP was established a year after the Bund. The Bund provided the infrastructure for the RSDLP's founding meeting. Nine revolutionaries were present, three were Bundists. The Bund played a big role in the anti Tsarist uprisings in 1905. By then, it had around 30,000 members, mostly workers, and about a third of them women. The RSDLP had seven or 8,000 members, many with higher education. One Bundis recalled, while Jewish bourgeois elements sang songs of blessing for the Tsar, while Jewish clericals preached humility in response to evil decrees, and Zionists promised Tsarist ministers, people dripping with workers' blood, Jewish blood, to lead the Jews out of Russia, Jewish workers under the red banners of the Bund fought for freedom in the front ranks of the revolution. But the early years of the revolution were um, of the Russian revolutionary movement were fraught with division. At the same 1903 Congress in London, 
when the party divided over strategy into Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, the Bund and several other delegates walked out when their just demand to organize autonomously in Yiddish among Jewish workers was defeated by Lenin's faction. In the debate, Trotsky, a Jew, supported Lenin against the Bund. But the first time Trotsky mentioned Jewish workers, a Bundist delegate got up and interrupted, and he said, among whom you have never worked. And in today's parlance, that would be called a truth bomb. Um, the Bund subsequently sided with the Mensheviks, as did Trotsky till 1917. Bundists were very prominent in the February 1917 re revolution that deposed the Tsar and in the Soviets that were created to advance the revolution. But like other non-Bolshevik leftists were repressed after the October revolution as the Bolsheviks consolidated exclusive power. And that was all well before Stalin's ascent. Some Bund factions split off from the Bund and joined the Bolsheviks, and many of them later died in Stalin's purges. Soon after the Russian Revolution, Poland regained independence, and by sheer demography, um, most Bundists now lived under Polish rule in cities where Jews often comprised a third of the whole population. I'll just say a little bit about some of the pictures, images you can see. Um, starting left to right from the top, there's um, a poster illustrating Tsarist oppression. Um, Bundists and other socialists in the middle one um, with uh, memorial ribbons for revolutionaries killed in 1905. The pink poster is advertising a meeting that is about evictions, an anti-evictions meeting about housing campaigns. Um, at the bottom one, bottom ones, we've got there's a, a group of women Bundists in Minsk in 1910, the Yiddish Arbiter newspaper, a May Day rally in 1933 in Warsaw. Look at the size of that. And then the last one is Bundis on a 1937 May Day march with placards supporting um, Spanish Republicans. Okay. The next slide. But the next and the most creative phase of the Bund developed in interwar Poland. As an outward looking independent movement, it built alliances wherever possible with non-Jewish socialists and with other minorities in Polish cities especially German, Lithuanian, and Ukrainian socialists. In Poland's politically menacing environment of the 30s, the Bund's ideological battles with Zionists, the religious establishment, and with the Communist Party became sharper. And to understand why, we need to know more about the Bund's philosophies and principles. Several ideologies, secular and religious, competed for followers on the Jewish streets. The two most prominent ones, Bundism and Zionism, had completely opposite values. Optimism versus pessimism. Integration versus isolation and emigration. Internationalism versus nationalism. Zionists said anti-Semitism could never be defeated. Bundists promoted safety through solidarity. They fought for robust, integrated, multicultural societies where minority rights were enhanced and their cultures valued, respected, and free to develop. For Zionists, Jewish safety could only happen in a their own fortress state. The Bundist Henrik Ehrlich accused Zionists of worshiping the same reactionary nationalist values that oppressed Jews and other minorities in history. He described Zionism as an open ally of anti-Semitism and of every kind of national chauvinism. The, the Zionist response to Jews' second-class status in Poland, he claimed, was to become first-class citizens in Palestine and make Arabs second-class citizens. The Bund's anti-Zionism stemmed from internationalism and anti-nationalism. They did not believe that Jews had to change territories and live in their own state to be fully Jewish or to practice their Jewish self-determination. Ehrlich had an illuminating exchange with the historian Simon Dubno on whether Zionism was a liberating and democratic movement in a hauntingly prescient passage, Ehrlich says, if a Jewish state should arise in Palestine, its spiritual climate will be eternal fear of the external enemy, brackets Arabs, eternal struggle for every foot of ground, for every bit of work with the internal enemy, brackets Arabs. Is this a climate in which freedom, democracy and progress can grow? Is it not the climate in which reaction and chauvinism flourish? So where was the Bund most active? Primarily in Poland, Europe's largest community, 
1939, there were 3.3 million Polish Jews. Barely 10% of them survived the Holocaust. Piłsudski led an increasingly authoritarian Polish government in the late 20s and 30s, which Bundis called semi-fascist. When he died in 1935, the political atmosphere moved further right. Open anti-Semites enjoyed greater, um, great, greater influence in parliament and on the streets. The far right instigated a boycott of Jewish shops and organized pogroms. And in the fourth picture across from the top, you'll see a painting by an artist I knew, refugee artist, Stajik Brunstein, um, of a um, synagogue burning um, in a pogrom. For anti-fascist here, 1936 means Cable Street. In Poland, it means Pzitik, where two Jews were killed in a pogrom in March 1936. The Bund called a half-day strike, a half-day strike observed by Jewish workers and shopkeepers throughout Poland, and supported too by several Polish Socialist Party affiliated unions. The Bund and the Polish Socialist Party's left wing led the daily physical and ideological struggle against anti-Semitism in 1930s Poland. Zionists abstained from it apart from one faction, uh, a left-wing faction called Left Politian. The Zionist priority was preparing and training young people for a future in Palestine. The Communist Party, much smaller than the Bund and made illegal by the government, was absent too from this fight, even though 40% of its members were Jews. They were preoccupied with a trade union turf war with the Bund over recruits and even attacked Bund Bundists physically. The rift with the CP, went back to the Bund's disputes with Lenin in 1903 and within the 1917 Soviets, where the Bund challenged what they saw as the Bolsheviks' authoritarian centralism. During Stalin's show trials, the Bundist Victor Alter wrote, a good Catholic must believe the Pope is infallible. A good communist must believe that Stalin is never mistaken. A good Bundist can and ought to ask himself whether his party, together with himself, is on the proper course. Every Bundist has the right to criticize the policy of his party. The Bund cared deeply about internal democracy. One Bundist I interviewed in the late 1980s told me, we looked up to our leaders, but they never looked down on us. They listened to us. In other parties, the leaders led and the others followed. We always respected the minority. This held us together. Historians attribute the Bund's rapid growth in 1930s Poland to their central and militant role fighting anti-Semitism. American um, Bundist academic Jack Jacobs, though, offers a broader explanation, and he highlights the world of progressive institutions the Bund created in this period, some of which are shown in the pics. Um, libraries, drama groups, sports groups, secular Yiddish progressive schools, militant trade union struggles, discussion circles on topics the rabbis forbade, youth and children's movements, um, 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 newspapers in Yiddish and Polish, an autonomous women's group that in particular unionized housemaids, um, anti-eviction campaigns, and a, re and a remarkable progressive institution near a forest outside of Warsaw called the Medem Sanatorium, which touched thousands of families. It was funded primarily through trade unions and donations from Bundists in America. It was a collectively run facility where impoverished young people prone to TB and other respiratory problems could spend up to six months recuperating. It was organized on the most advanced democratic lines by children forming committees and being responsible for its daily life. And in the bottom right pic, uh, there's a bottom right picture, you'll see a group of teenagers at the Medem Sanatorium, probably mid 1930s. I will tell you something remarkable about that picture soon. In 1938 and 39, municipal elections were held all over Poland. The Zionist and ultra-religious parties had achieved impressive results in the 1920s and early 30s, but they were losing ground to the Bund. In 38 and 39, the secular socialist anti-Zionist Bund swept the Jewish vote in most cities with substantial Jewish populations. The cities with the biggest populations were Warsaw and Lodz. In Lodz, there were 11 Jewish councillors. Seven of them were from the Bund. In Warsaw, there were 20 Jewish councillors. 16 of them were from the Bund. At the most critical time before the Nazi invasion, 
the Jewish masses voted for the Bund as their best as their best chance. Um, in the walled ghettos under Nazi occupation, cut off from the world, Bundist Zionists and communists had to learn to trust each other and cooperate. In October 42, they forged a united combat organization, the ZOB, to lead an uprising against the uh, occupiers. Right-wing Zionists stayed aloof from the ZOB, and most Zionists active in the resistance were leftists. Bundists fought in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and in battles in other ghettos. Marek Edelman chronicled the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in his book, The Ghetto Fight, published in Polish in 1945, translated into Yiddish and English in 1946. And it tells you something about the battle over Holocaust memory that Edelman was not invited to give testimony to the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem in 1961. Then the ghetto fight was not translated into Hebrew until after the millennium. I want to come back to that picture of the kids in the Medem Sanatorium. On the top row to the right is Marek Edelman as a teenager. Third from left in the next row is Vlad Kamid, and the fifth from the left is Hannah Frischdorf. All of them, a few years on, were Warsaw Ghetto resistors and survivors. Edelman and Hannah were fighters, Vladka undertook the most dangerous work as a courier living outside the ghetto with false Polish papers. Um, the second picture from the left I find extremely moving. It's a May Day march taking place through the utter ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto after the complete destruction of the ghetto and much of Warsaw. And there, there's Bundes still marching on May Day. The Bund attempted to rebuild among survivors in Poland after the war, but a terrible pogrom in 1946 in Kielce, in which 48, 42 Jews were murdered, prompted many survivors to flee Poland for good. And as Poland became a one-party state, the Bund was pressurized to dissolve, which it did in Poland in 1949. Okay, I'm gonna to move to the last slide. Um, Bundist refugees formed small groups in, East, in Western Europe um, and in North and South America and Australia and even in Palestine. But with growing enthusiasm around the Jewish world for a Jewish state, while survivors languished unwanted in DP camps, the Bund was increasingly marginalised politically, except in Australia, where a Bund organisation has functioned since 1927 to the present day. And you can see a picture in the bottom right of some young uh, Australian Bundists um, on a protest um, in recent years. The Bund's political centre moved to North America and Western Europe. They continued to make statements and campaign where possible and strengthen progressive Yiddish cultural initiatives. They released very powerful statements in 1947, rejecting partition in Palestine, calling for an independent unitary state based on democracy, justice and equal rights for Arabs and Jews. They said the peaceful coexistence of Jews and Arabs must be brought about by the renunciation of the Zionist goal of an independent Jewish state on the part of the Jewish community on the one hand, and on the other, the Arabs recognition of the basic democratic principle proclaiming that a country belongs to its entire population. Palestine should thus be regarded as belonging both to the Arabs and the Jews. Uh, it either counts as a one state or a no state solution. Um, the bottom left is a very interesting picture as well. It's um, a Bund contingent on the 1963 March on Washington, um, where Martin Luther King spoke. Um, were there Bundists here? Well, in the early 20th century, political exiles from the Russian Empire formed Bund groups here and encouraged Jews to join trade unions and had their own publications. Together with anarchists, they created the Workers' Circle, um, a mutual aid friendly society among Yiddish speaking immigrant workers. And they did a lot of cultural and educational work. Early Bundists here focused mainly though on how they could help the organization back home. And there's a picture at the top of a, of a Bund picnic. I think it's in Epping, Epping Forest and, um, uh, in 1902. And the, if you go across the next picture, is a picture of Bundists holding guns and knives. These are self-defense squads in 1905. And the Bundists here did collections among people and sent money 
back to those self-defense squads to buy guns and knives. That was one of the ways that they were helping. Um, after World War II, Bundes survivors set up an independent Jewish socialist organization here in Britain that was active for a few years. The picture in the, right in the middle is from around 1950, and that's a meeting of Bundes here in London. And the third, the second person on the front row um, um, from the left is Maya Bogdansky. And there's a better picture of Maya Bogdansky on the top right. He joined the Jewish Socialist Group in the mid 1980s and was a member until he died in 2005. OK, last bit. What does it mean to call yourself a Bundist now? And what's its relevance today? It means asserting yourself confidently as a secular socialist anti-nationalist Jew who recognizes the clash of political and economic interests within our community, who rejects Zionism and the centrality of Israel in Jewish life, who combats anti-Semitism from any quarter, who fights all racism by working alongside and in solidarity with other minorities for full equality. As the Asian youth movement said in the 70s, here to stay, here to fight. And it's someone who stands up for refugees against borders and stands with workers' struggles for social justice. And being a Bundist today means exposing the harm that Zionism does on a daily basis to Palestinians, but also to Jewish communities when it tries to corral them into reactionary stances against their own interests as a minority here. Being a Bundist means celebrating diverse Jewish cultural creativity in different Jewish languages, together with the cultural riches of other minority communities. It means promoting a socialism that is culturally pluralist and fully democratic in ends and means. Being a Bundist means identifying with a radical history and fighting for a radical future. How can Bundism enrich our lives and activities as Jewish socialists today? Um, I'll leave that one up to you. Thank you.